usually describing hope. We talked about that last Sunday. The second candle talks about faith. It talks about peace. It really talks about several things. And so, you know, when you talk about our scripture this morning, which comes from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 1, the first thing you hear is comfort, comfort. We can have peace knowing that we're comforted in Jesus Christ. We can have faith that comes from knowing that we're comforted in that peace. So as we light the second candle this morning, we light it in remembrance of the comfort and the hope and the peace that comes from Christ our Lord. when those wicks have been used several times. It doesn't necessarily want to work the way that it's supposed to work. This morning, as I was driving up the hill, there's one thing I noticed quickly. That the first thing that I noticed was, thank you, Lord, that I have four-wheel drive. Because there's white stuff on this road that isn't on the other roads I've been driving on this morning. And so I said, thank you, Lord, so much for this truck that you have given me. And that the new tires that you have provided, and I'm not going all slippery, sloppily all over the road. Thank you, Lord, for that. I am thankful this morning. Thankful for several things, and I'm thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for this scripture this morning, because if you know anything about this scripture, there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on in Israel. People not listening to God, people not hearing His voice. Hmm. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Maybe we can hear echoes of what's happening in the Old Testament passage. We can hear echoes today. There's not a lot of people that are hearing the voice of the Lord. There's not a lot of people that understand His comfort and His hope and His peace that He wants to bring us. And we're doing everything we can to kick God out exactly like Israel was doing and embrace everything else that is in the world. And we're doing that. We're kicking God out of everywhere that we should be saying, God, come. Amen. God, come. God, come into our country. God, come into our homes. Please, God, come into our schools. families, our courthouses, our government officials. God, we need you. Hear the words of the Lord from prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, beginning in verse 1, and I'll be reading from the, the ESV this morning. It says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Listen to that again. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. <coughs> Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. I, 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 I hear those words, speak tenderly. And I hear a loving Heavenly Father say, speak tenderly. Because I hear so many people, Don't do that! Stop! First of all, if you're saying, Don't do that! Stop! And you're trying to tell a kid that, it's going to freak them out more than it would be. Speak tenderly. This is what God's telling us this morning. Hear that. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. <coughs> Cry to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she is received from the Lord's hand, double for all her sin. A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Here we hear John in our New Testament reading. Make straight the desert a highway for our Lord our God, every valley shall be lifted, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all the flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all beauty is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the Lord, 
our God will stand forever. Go high up on the mountain, O Zion. Herald the good news. <laughs> Lift up the voices with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald the good news. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and His arms rule with for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and He recompense before Him. He will tend His flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in His arms. He will carry them in His bosom and gently lead those that are young. This is the word of the Lord. Good news this morning. Good news to us. You know, during this time I've been seeing, all I've been seeing is people getting ready for Christmas or trying to. I have people that have told me, that they, said, they said, it's almost done. Are we ever really done, if you think about it? But how can we really get ready for Christmas? Spiritually speaking, religiously, how can we get ready for Christmas? That's what this Old Testament prophecy is trying to talk to us about. So let's look at the Word of God and let's see. The first thing that we can see is how can I get ready for Christmas? The first thing that we can do is share God's comfort. Share God's comfort. Verse 1 says, God surely wants us. And he says, comfort, comfort. But God surely wants us to have his comfort. And we know this because he says in verse 1, comfort, yes, comfort my people. God was speaking to a people who were desperately needed to be comforted. Their nation, their temple, thousands would be carried away, many be killed. They were going to need comfort. And guess what? So do we. We need comfort. Is there anybody out there this morning that just says, I need comfort? I need that comfort. God was speaking desperately. Christmas is a time of celebration, but it can also be a difficult time for those. Painful memories of those that are lost. Loved ones that we miss, that we don't get to celebrate Christmas with. Many, many here have lost family members and friends. Some have even lost families and friends this past year. And it hurts. But God wants to comfort you and He can do it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, He tells us that He is the Father of mercies and a God of all comfort. And He wants to comfort us in all of our tribulations. Tribulation. That means all the stuff, anything that's going wrong, God wants to be your comfort. We can see God's comfort here in verse 2, where He says, Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to us. Here, their warfare has ended. Their iniquity is pardoned. She has received the Lord's hand from all their sin, but God is going to comfort them. It's over. It's over. They paid the penalty. I am here, and they are going to be comforted. Yesterday I had the privilege, yes, I had the privilege to have four children at my house on Friday and, and Saturday most of the day and then we picked up a fifth one and even the sixth one later. Mom goes, my kids, they're a hot mess. Hot mess! And you know what? Maybe for a time there was some of that hot mess that was going on. But you know what? There was a time to where each one of them, each one of them, plopped in my lap, wrapped their arms around me, and just sat there. And said, we love you so much. I was like, I've been here all of the And you love me so much. But they had that comfort. They had that comfort that no matter what was happening, and, and, and I can remember at one time, my knee was hurting so bad because it was being used as a jungle gym, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because they were comfortable. They were being helped. And no matter how much pain I was going through at that moment, no matter how much pain I'm in right now, I was comforted knowing that they had comfort. That they felt comfortable. That they felt loved. That's what God can do for us this Christmas. That's what God wants to do for us this Christmas. That's where the faith comes in. That's where peace comes in. 
Because we can have faith knowing that no matter what's going on in our lives, we can never be too bad that we can't just come to God, lay it all out before Him, and say, Father God, please forgive me, and He will forgive us, and we can find comfort in that. Amen? You are never too dirty or too far away from Christ. Think of that this morning. That's comfort. You can have comfort in that this morning. I have comfort in the fact that I'm going to see a going bald, fluffy-headed, college-age student on Thursday afternoon. And yes, he's going bald. And he can thank his grandfather for that. But to see his face yesterday, I told Heather, I said, I was teasing with her, and I had just gotten talk, done talking to him, and I said, honey, I said, Man, I said, Joseph forgot to turn an assignment in. And I said, I, I, I said he has to get a, a grade to make sure that he has this. And, and she's going, what? And I said, no, he's got all these. They're fixed on <laughs> But I had, to, I had to get her going just a little bit. But we have that comfort knowing that we don't ever have to say, hey, Joseph, how's your grades? He takes care of it. This morning, Wherever you're at, no matter what's going on, pain, sorrow, sickness, lost, confused, you can have comfort knowing that Jesus Christ is there. And that He's came. And that He's coming again. Amen. And that His salvation is available. That anybody that calls out, you can have comfort knowing that all you have to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, here I am, Jesus. He will come. And He will help you. And He will guide you. That's comfort this morning. God says her warfare has ended. One day the struggles will be over. God wants you to have comfort this morning. Not only that, but He wants you to give it. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Those are commands not just for Isaiah, not just for the other prophets, not just for preachers, not just for Jesus. It's a command for all of God's people to comfort my people. That's why in 2 Corinthians verse 1, chapter 1, it says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort, who comforts us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort that we receive from our God. Why can we offer comfort? Because God comforts us, and then we can comfort those that need that comfort. And it can come through a song. It can come through a smile. It can come through being a jungle gem as I learned yesterday. Because even in the midst of a hot mess, God is able to provide comfort. Do you believe that this morning? That's the message of Christmas. It's not this, this tree which is beautiful that represents and we went through that. But it's not in these bulbs. It's not in these presents. It's surely not in the amount of money we spend on those presents. It's in God. This morning, teens, young adults, children, if you need to hear a voice this morning, hear the one that is comforting. Hear the one that says, I want to provide you comfort. He wants to give it. So how can I get ready for Christmas? We can share God's comfort. But also there's another thing we can do. We can get rid of all the clutter that's in your life. Verse 3 and 5 are prophecies that John the Baptist would come to prepare the way for Jesus. Verse 3, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain, every hill shall be made low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. In verse 3, he says, prepare the way of the Lord. This is an important word picture. Because 
In the original language, it's the picture of turning away from something and turning to the face of something else. In this case, it's turning our face to the Lord, and this is crucial because there are things we need to turn away from in this life, and we better be turning to God. Quit listening to all the other influences that are out there that tries to tell you there's more than one way to Jesus. There's no truth out there. Yes, there is. The truth is found in Jesus Christ, and He's the only way you're ever going to see God. Amen? That's truth this morning. Turn away from all that garbage that's out there. My mom used to say this. She says, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, you're going to have garbage come out. I had a friend. He says, man, I'm excited about all of this we tried to tell them to slow down at the Christmas party. We were teenagers. And you know all the desserts that are there, right? He decided that he was going to go all in on the desserts. We kept telling him to slow down. There's going to be games. There's going to be things. Slow down. No, no, just kept piling in, piling in, piling in. Finally, it all came out. <laughs> it all came out. It isn't pretty for anybody. <coughs> And it surely wasn't smelly. I mean, wow. Just imagine. I'm not trying to be gross. But guys, if you put a bunch of garbage in, there's going to be garbage that comes out. You're listening to a bunch of garbage on the radio, it's eventually going to come out in how you speak, how you act, how you talk to people. If you're watching stuff on television, it's going to eventually come out. If you're reading in books, if you're playing and shooting up games all the time, it's eventually going to come out. Be careful what you're putting in. Be careful. I'm not saying this to condemn anybody, but I'm just saying be careful what you put in because it will come out. I used to have people that tell me, Oh, I'm just listening to the beat. Boom, chicka, 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 boom, chicka, boom, chicka, 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 whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> you tell everybody you listen to a country song backwards, you get your wife back, your dog back, your house back. But some of that garbage. Trust me, you're listening to enough or boom, but you get whatever it is, you're going to hear the words and it's going to come out. You're going to start singing it. It's going to start coming out how you treat people. Women, <coughs> friends, family. I'm saying this because I've seen it done so many times. We've got to be careful what we're putting in. Get rid of that stuff. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I had another friend that called me just this week and said, Chad, I lost my brother. Car accident. Drunk driver. My grandson overdosed. My best friend was shot in a gang shooting. Why am I saying all this stuff? Because we're not guaranteed another second on this earth. And we need to prepare you for the way for the Lord. Get ready and be ready for when Christ comes. It's time to take things seriously. It's time to wake up and realize that there is a heaven. There is a hell. Amen. There is a devil. There is Jesus. And the devil's going to do everything he can to try to take you to hell with him. And he will lie and cheat and steal and do everything he can to make things look good, and then you're on a pathway to hell. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because Jesus said, prepare ye the way for the Lord. Are there low places in your life, things that bound you, things that pull you down? Are there mountains, things that rise up and stand between you and God? What are things that are distracting you, steering you off of the Lord's path right, right now? What are things that you're making your life tough? Life would go smoother if you would just let those things go. 
I know good people that are letting things stand in between the way of their of God. Good things, things that seem good, things like work. Work's a good thing because it provides for us, it helps us, it, it, it gives us a house, it, it provides for our family so we can have food. But did you know that there are people that place work before God? Don't let your job stand before you and God. Don't let it. I had somebody tell me just the other day, Pastor, I just don't have time to read the Bible. I said, I don't think you have enough time not to read the Bible. I said, Pastor, I just can't find enough time to pray. I don't think you can have enough time not to pray. Think about it. Lift up the low places, tear down the hill, straighten the curves, smooth out the rust spots. How can I get ready for Christmas? Get rid of all the clutter. Get rid of the clutter. Help people connect with the true meaning of Christmas. In verse 6 it says, cry out. God wants all believers to make sure the message is coming out loud and clear to a lost and dying world. Nothing is more important, but for most people the true meaning of Christmas gets lost in the mall or under the Christmas tree. Hear the good news. People are more open to the message of Jesus Christ than you imagine. And it's our job to help them understand. So what's the message? Isaiah breaks it down. He breaks it down this way. In verse 6 and 7, there's not some really good news there. It says, all flesh and all grass and the flowers in the field. You know what that's telling us right there? That's telling us that our time on this earth is short. I know a lady that just had her 101st birthday. And she was putting some moves on. I was like, I can't even move that well at 44, let alone 101 trying to do it. I mean, come on. But you know, even 101 years, that's short when eternity comes. Because eternity lasts forever. Think about your Christmases long ago. Does anybody here, I was very surprised about this on the ridge. Does anybody here have something that you got for Christmas when you were a kid? Anybody? Anybody? Few. Did you know almost everybody raised their hand up there? I was like, whoa. You all are hoarders. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But think about it. Most of the stuff that we have is broken or it's long gone. It's sitting in a landfill somewhere. I do. I have some of those things that I got from Christmas when I was a kid. I have some dinosaurs that I got plush dinosaurs when I was seven, eight, something like that. And guess what? The plush is still as good as it was back then. In fact, Elizabeth still plays with them. Last night they were being thrown around and I was saying, oh no! I've had them for 44 years now. Gone. No, I didn't do that. But think about it. Think about it. Life is short. Death is short. And we must be ready to go. People desperately need the Lord. Is there anybody out here today that could say, there's nobody that doesn't need God? People desperately need God today. Amen. And they need to hear it from us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. Did you hear that? The Word of God stands forever. Amen. The most popular book that's out there right now is going to be gone tomorrow. But the Word of God stands forever. <coughs> Beyonce is going to stop singing. But the Word of God stands forever. Think of that. It never fails. It never leaves. It never forsakes. And it stands forever forever. Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand and His arms shall rule Him. Behold, the Word of God stands forever and it's the good news for all of those that trust in the Lord. I love this story. There was uh, an author named Stephen Ambrose. 
And he wrote a story of an American paratrooper in World War II. Some have probably read the book, and some of you have probably even seen the miniseries. It's called The Band of Brothers. One of the few men to survive, beginning and end, was Sergeant Skinny Sisk. And after the war, Sisk had a hard time shaking his memories. In July of 1991, he wrote a letter to Captain Dick Winters to explain. Skinny wrote, My career after the war was trying to drink away the truckload of cruts that I stopped in Holland, the diehard Nazis that I went up to the Barbarian Alps and killed. Old Mole Alley made a statement that all the killings that I did was going to chump into bed with me one of these days, and they surely did. I had a lot of flashbacks after the war, and I started drinking. My little sister's daughter, four years old, came into my bedroom, and it was too unbearable for the rest of the family because either I was hungover or I was drunk. She stepped into my room at four years old and she told me that Jesus loved me and she loved me too. And if I would repent, God would forgive me for all the men that I kept trying to kill over and over again. That little girl got to me and I put her out of my room. I told her to go to her mommy. And then there, I bowed my head on my mother's old feather pillow and I repented. And God forgave me for the war and all the bad things that I've done through the years. I was ordained in the latter part of 1949 in the ministry. And believe me, Dick, I haven't even whipped but one man since, and he deserved it. I have four children, nine, great -grand nine grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. And Lord willing, if Jesus tarries, I hope to see all of you at the next reunion. If not, I'll see you at the last jump. Jesus Christ can save any soul. He can change any life, and that's the true meaning of Christmas. Please try your best to invite someone to come to church this Christmas season. Every Sunday morning, they'll hear a message about how Christmas can change their world. And here's more of the good news. We see it in verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are young. What a God we have who wants to have that relationship with you. He wants to be your good shepherd. He wants to provide for you, to protect you. This is the heart of Christianity. This is the essence of salvation. A personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. God wants to have that close personal relationship with you. He will gather the lambs with His arms. He will carry them in His bosom. And He will carry you. That's the message. That's faith. That's hope this morning. A pastor gave a great testimony about being carried by his father. As a five-year-old, he said, I would pretend to fall asleep during the evening worship service. If I did, I knew my dad would carry me home. I would do this because we walked to and from church, and it was about a mile each way. Being little wasn't the problem. My length wasn't the problem. I enjoyed walking. However, my older brothers teased me by telling me that in one of the fields we walked through was the boogeyman who would get me, and it frightened me. One night I really did fall asleep. Dad picked me up. I woke up right away, but he continued, but I continued to pretend to be asleep, and he carried me. That night we went right through the frightening field, and I was not one bit afraid. Are you afraid this morning? Are you lost? Are you lonely? Are you hurting? Are you confused? If so, you have a loving God that says, I want to wrap my arms around you. I want to pick you up and I want to carry you. And I did that by sending my son, Jesus Christ, who was the babe that was born in a manger. Who died on a cross with his blood and his broken body. Who is alive today at the right hand of the Father. Who says, I want to carry you. I've covered your sins. 
Maybe you're here this morning and, and you have the good news and you're living for Christ and you know that Christ redeems you and you know that Christ sanctifies you and you know that Christ saves you and is preparing you. Then He's saying to you this morning, you're the voice that Israel needs to hear. Oh, let me draw a little closer. You're the voice that Titusville needs to hear. You're the voice your co-worker needs to hear. Your friends need to hear. Your neighbor needs to hear. 